Welcome to the September 20th, 2017 meeting of the Public Works Advisory Board. Uh, Jan Goldman indicated she would not be able to attend the meeting tonight. All the rest of the members are present, so I'll call the meeting to order. Are there any announcements? Are there any presentations? None. It's public comment period. Anyone, members of the public that would like to um, address the board on city business matters that are not on the agenda may do so at this time. Seeing none, we'll close public comment period. First item on the agenda is the consent calendar, the approval of the minutes. Has everyone had a chance to peruse the minutes and if there are any, um, any corrections or additions, please state them now. If none, would someone make a motion to approve? I'll make the motion to approve the minutes as stated. And I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of August 16th, 2017 regular meeting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Motion carries. First item on the B1 business items is the director's report. Rob? Direct user report is a summary of activities that um, have taken place between um, our consolidated maintenance, water, wastewater, um, storm drain, street trees are typical topics, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board members might have on the director's report. Are there <coughs> any questions from the board? John? Uh, yeah, I've got a few lists. Um, I was looking at the... Um, There is state water re resources, state water quality uh, control board's uh, thing under stormwater, and we're opting to go with track two for uh, controlling uh, contamination from. I guess it's from trash. Yes. Uh, can you fill me in a little bit of um, what what's what's involved in doing track two? So track one would be we would put a capture device on every. Um, um, storm drain in the city. Um, track two allows us to assess where we think it'd be most effective, put capture devices. Um, we can, um, if we don't have a trash problem in certain watersheds um, and sub watersheds, we can opt out of um, installing capture devices there. So it gives us um, um, a few more options. We just have to do a little bit more work ahead of time. So track one allows you to just not do any planning or um, assessment and just install capture devices. Um, um, we pick uh, track two based on cost, um, installing all those capture, the capture devices that are approved by the state board are not inexpensive. Um, so um, track two seemed to provide a more cost effective method. So what's a typical track or uh, capture device? Um, they run all the way from a um, pan in a catch basin to a um, looks like a um, net bag at the end of a um, outlet. Um, they have to be approved by the state board and they have to be able to basically um, prevent a cigarette butt from um, escaping. Oh. Okay. But not cause um, <laughs> clogging and flooding. Okay. Uh, I have a question then. Is So putting uh, one of these capture bags at the end of outfalls into some of the detention basins, is that within the scope of these, ba these capture devices? Yes. Okay. Um, and is that the sort of thing that you're going to be looking at rather than putting on each catch basin just before it releases to the environment you'll correct okay uh, next one under streets uh, you said C item B2 do you mean B3 yes it uh, was changed in between the uh, finalization of the director's report and the final publication of the agenda okay um, the trees section there uh, apparently there's a you know 
also a tree at Las Tunas, which you were planning on uh, removing. Is that right? I believe so. Mike may have some additional information on that. Yes, yeah, tree at 1150 Las Tunas that has been removed. And there are two more, one at 755 Kern and one at uh, 575 Fresno okay. that have been posted, uh, evaluated by an arborist and posted for removal about 11 days ago. So they're, they're slated for removal also this year. Do you have any special procedures to prevent the canker fungus or whatever it is from spreading as you remove the tree? I'm told that uh, there is no method or there is no treatment to, to prevent it. Um, to, there, are, there are best practices to prevent the spread by, by leaving the wood on site or the wood chips nearby so that you're not spreading it to another location within the city or to another county. Okay. Um, I had a question about on the wastewater collections. I keep forgetting how many feet of sewer main do we have in Morro Bay? I don't know how many feet we have. We have about the same amount as we have center line miles of street, so that's 54 miles. So that would be 54 times, that would be about 600,000? Um, I'm not going to do math in public without a calculator. <laughs> About 285,000 feet. 285,000, so we do about 10% a month is yeah. the goal. Okay. Um, I had a question about reconstruct and repair at the end of a sewer main at Gilbert Street after a cleaning jet nozzle got lodged in the line. Was the sewer main crushed, or is it, or is it just something plot? We'll let Joe answer that. He has the details. Yes, that's, uh, that's down in the beach track area. And when that uh, area was developed, uh, those uh, lines used to go all the way across where the, where the freeway is now. So they actually were just severed and plugged off on the, at the end of the lines where the freeway is. So when we clean those, uh, there's really no clean out at the end. So they do have the, the chance or the potential to get the line stuck in there. We got it stuck and we actually dug it up and then repaired the line the proper way and put the clean outs up. So we do have a long term plan to actually either replace the, a lot of those laterals, uh, those, those mains in the back, they're all in the backyards. Either replace them or uh, properly install cleanouts at the end of those runs. Uh, was this stuff learned by doing video surveys or, or just? It's it's a. Uh, we do know the history of that area, so uh, just by cleaning it uh, through the through through the years, we know that they've all were cut when that freeway was put in. So uh, you know, as time goes on, we slowly repair them. Okay, thank you. And that's my last question on the staff report. On Chris, steps. Chris, do you have anything? Two. Uh, Rob, on a uh, attachment three to this map, I went out and walked it, and it appears to be wrong in some respects. And a um, first of all, and that's the streets map. Yeah. So we'll be discussing that item with uh, B2, B3. That was my question. We're yeah. going to be discussing that on the screen then. Yes. Excellent. Okay. But we won't have the map up on the screen. You won't? No. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get some comments in. <laughs> Thanks. That's all for me. Okay. Mine's going <coughs> to, excuse me, mine's going to be quick tonight, Rob. Um, it's more of a housekeeping thing. I see Rick's, Rick Sauerwein's name showing up as a staff contact. I assume he's no longer with the city, correct? That's correct. Oh, we didn't that, edit that out of there. It's an easy night. I have no other questions. Okay, thanks. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, there was one other question I had, which I didn't. I should have noted it. Um, you have a new uh, assistant city engineer? We have a new assistant civil engineer, Pam Newman. Um, so um, she was promoted from engineering tech. And we got a new recent Cal Poly grad that was hired to fill the engineering tech position. We have no associate or senior civil um, as of yet. Those recruitments, we reopened back up again and um, have not had a lot of success in filling those. Uh, where is Pam on uh, the uh, licensing track? 
Um, she is going for her EIT. Okay. Has she had any experience? Are you, is she the one you're going to be training on cost estimating when it? Well, we're hoping to get a more senior level um, engineer in mm -hmm. to uh, that has some experience in uh, project and cost estimating. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, Christian. I have one additional question. Um, when John was talking about the stormwater uh, tract, um, will we be seeing that uh, plan before it's implemented and any ballpark figure of when it might be before us? Um, yes, you will be seeing that plan um, in a couple of venues. You'll be seeing it with as Corolla updates the stormwater master plan. They'll be bringing those um, um, that information to PWAB, and then as we um, develop um, the watershed analysis, um, Damaris will be bringing um, that forward. Um, we have um, a couple of years to do our assessment and implementation. So over the next couple of years, we'll be bringing that to PWAB. Um, luckily, it wasn't a immediate unfunded mandate. Uh, we have some time to uh, uh, move forward with this. I, thank you. Do you have an estimate for a the engineering and b for the actual work then? Not yet. Okay. Seeing no further questions on the uh, B one director's report, we'll go to B two the discussion of Adopt-A-Park, Street, and Memorial programs. Rob? Turn this over to Janine, who um, has done um, the lion's share of the work on this, and she'll present a staff report and uh, then open it up for questions and public comment. Thank you and good evening. Um, the presentation is gonna be kind of short. You've seen this information previously uh, a few months ago where we brought forward some information regarding the various memorial programs for benches, trees, uh, and bike racks, as well as the Adopt-A-Park and, and Adopt-A-Street programs. The, this information went to the City Council um, earlier this year, and they directed staff to, because there were multiple resolutions over the years that created various aspects of these programs and had various different funding mechanisms and identified that what they want to do is have those resolutions rescinded, have a new resolution where all of that would be housed in one location, and then take uh, the new fee structure for the uh, new concrete benches that have been placed out at the Rock and at Tideland's, uh, not Tideland's Park, sorry, Target Rock area. Uh, that have some memorial plaque capabilities and identifying the fee structure for those and, and bringing that all back to them uh, for final approval and adoption. And what the idea is to do is have a sort of a kind of a booklet that would have a page that would list the, the, the various memorial program or the adopt a park or adopt a street program, what that is, give a little description. Um, if there's fees associated with that, identifying where those are located, and then having an, an application, and then eventually if there's an agreement um, that would be associated with it, such as the Adopt-A-Park or Adopt-A-Street programs, that that information would be all available, that we would create a page on our website, <coughs> we'd have this uh, paper information, these booklets available as well, so that people can find that information and look and see if this is something they're interested in, in uh, contacting the city and pursuing. So what you have before you tonight is the, um, the poli program policy page and a draft of the application that we, we put together uh, for each of these. And so what we would like for you to do tonight is just to provide some comment on those, if there's any um, additions that we should include, if there's any comments um, or, or something that we haven't included in here from a previous discussion, and uh, a similar thing with the application. 
And then what we would do is we would take that information, incorporate any changes into it, and then be bringing that to the city council uh, for their final adoption. Uh, currently, we don't have any draft agreement in here. That's something that's still being worked on and would need to go through our city attorney's office to get their input and final kind of uh, final approval of, of a draft that would go to the council for consideration. So with that, I will turn it over to the board for any questions uh, or comments on each of the various um, pol program policies and applications and um, take a motion if you need to feel that you want to make one. Okay, thank you, Janine. Um, we'll start on the left this time. Steve, do you have any questions? Um, the only one you said, it doesn't include a draft agreement, so there will be an agreement between the person who decides to do this. And the only question, I, or the only reason I ask that is, I think it needs to tie down aspects, especially being out on the street within the public right of way. I, I, I get concerned when you have people m milling around, and I think you got to tie down what these people's what they can and can't do. Correct, while and in and there. and that's something where we would be identifying locations. We would be identifying the type of activities that we are interested in, the individual or the group or organization who's volunteering, and spelling out some of those types of concerns because liability is an issue. So we want to make sure that the city is covered appropriately, right. uh, and that yeah, the I just want to make sure something was in place beyond just. Yes, and and if you see, like in the in the uh, um, the applications for the adopt a park and adopt a street, there's some kind of waiver language that has yet to be run through and and completely identified from the city attorney on how specific that might be. So that might change a little bit between what you see here and what what may be ending up right. at um, council's um, staff oh, report. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Christian. Um, yeah, just along that same line. I have done the adopt highway in a couple of states, so I know you might be able to get the, the Caltrans one, because I think besides the indemnity language, they, they do specify uh, small things like high-vis vests be worn, and then they also do a uh, mandatory cleanup dates. So just in case people aren't doing it and taking the burden off of you know that day-to-day -day management, they set forth uh, mandatory cleanup dates that that if you are falling behind, you're still going to achieve the adopt a street, adopt a park program on those on those prescribed dates. Yes, definitely. That that's one of the things that we would want to include in with the agreement uh, or the the whether it's the agreement letter or. or whatever function it comes out is how, how often are we expecting these activities to be performed and then having periodic meetings with the individual or the organization to make sure those are being accomplished and if there's any issues that um, the individual or the organization wants to bring up that need to be addressed. So definitely. Anything else? Okay, Stu, we'll let you go this time. Thank you. <laughs> Are they going to be? Uh, they're going to be on contract for a year or be approved for a year on this? Is that correct? Historically, the the adoptions have been for a one year period. Um, so we would be looking to do a similar thing, having that adoption be for a one year period. That can be extended if the individual or the organization is still interested in and willing and wanting to do that. Will we be getting a report from them um, uh, monthly or bi-monthly uh, to find out what they've found and what we record, what the recommendations are going to be? Well, I don't know that it would. Be, it certainly could be something that they write up, but I would think that during the periodic meetings that would be set up between staff and the organization or, or volunteers, that anything that has come up is, that is an issue or something that they may need, that would be addressed at that point. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be some written report that gets submitted. Okay. That's fine. That's all I have. I, I think my only question is, <clears throat> is on the, the signage aspect of it. Obviously. We're trying to give them some recognition, <clears throat> though typically when we see it like on a freeway, it's like you see one sign, 
every few miles or something. Um, yeah. Are these going to be rather smaller signs or something? So it's just not, the town's just not cluttered full of signs basically at this point then? That's something that hasn't been, at least internally, talked about with staff is to the exact, the size, the the lettering, the verbiage. Um, I think we would probably be looking at some other organizations that do these types of programs and see what they have in the way for their recognition and, and looking to them to not have to reinvent the wheel for ourselves. I agree with you that we don't want to have a lot of clutter. <laughs> visual clutter uh, happening, so we do want to make sure that it's appropriate to the, the space and location, is visible enough that somebody could see it for the, rec excuse me, the recognition, but to not kind of overpower the location as well. Thank you. Um, a couple things popped up. Who pays for the adopter signs? Is that going to be the adopter or, or the city will pay for the signs? We haven't really discussed internally um, what we would be doing with that, whether that would be because city costs, when it, as, as we would be providing things like vests or bags or gloves, whether the signage would be part of that or whether that would become part of the application. Okay. Uh, goals for the activities for the adopters when they're doing the maintenance stuff, are you... Are you going to develop some goals for them? Yes. Uh, okay. We would be identifying uh, for the the various parks or the various street areas what activities that we would like to have accomplished and uh, a frequency of when those activities would be occurring so that we would be able to go out and identify has have these activities been done or haven't they? Okay. Are you also going to kind of get some guidelines for labor hours for the activities? Or is it going to be completely up to the adopters to hit the goals and whatever they do is, is fine? Just so they have an idea what they're getting into. I think a lot of that has to work out with the particular adopter and the location. Um, I think that gets spelled out in the agreement. Um, Okay. I would almost see it as a negotiated scope of work um, <laughs> that we both agree on once we've negotiated that. Okay, yeah, that's the way it hits me too. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple questions. Um, on the uh, racks with plaques, I notice on the draft form there was no place for the uh, message. Um, will the city be reviewing the message, or is that just an oversight of the of the draft for the bike racks the the donor once the city has approved the location they contact peak racks they arrange for the ordering of it they pay for it they arrange with peak racks the message because they're doing the plaque so we we don't become the middle person for that on the other the uh, other, the, the for other the plaques for the other plaques the city is is, or, doing is the, the one who's doing the ordering but does the city have any discretion as to what can or cannot go onto a plaque besides the number of spaces and letters? I don't believe the existing ordinances that have been adopted indicated specifics. Um, other than in the tree plaque, it had indicated the tree species. And we are not recommending to carry that over because if we put in a tree, the tree doesn't survive. Obviously, we're not going to want to put in the same tree type if it's not going to survive in that location. So then the individual has to buy another plaque. So we, we felt that it, taking that part of off of it um, was something that we wanted to change. But other than that, the other ordinances that council have adopted have, I'm sorry, the resolutions they've adopted haven't specified particular language um, to be included. I've seen in another city that I worked in, um, these become advertising um, signs um, rather than memorial um, signs. So a business might uh, um, get something for um, to advertise their specific business um, 
I, City of San Luis Obispo, um, thought that was that was fine because they're paying for the plaque, but uh, n not the entire community embraced that. So how are you? Going we're to be we're silent on it right now. We Pardon? have no we have no criteria for um, uh, your honoring um, um, your grandmother or your honoring. A1 locksmiths. Um, um, we have, we're, we're silent on that and have no specific policy because there has never been a policy in the past in any of the resolutions that were passed regarding what copy could occur on the um, memorial. Okay. I think the only thing that I'm remembering is there was a discussion about whether pets could be memorialized. And that was something that the council did not want to have pets memorialized, they wanted people memorialized. And that was about it. They didn't go into specifics for how that language would be. And that would just be on the benches or would that be for the parks that and was, trees or the Well, that was for the, the benches and the tree plaques. Okay. And let's see. I guess I'm hesitant on the racks to plaques, it sounds like we're limiting the only type of rack um, to be installed on the on the streets are these, you know, peak ones. Because um, I've been in a lot of communities where they have great artistic um, bike racks. And uh, I just, you know, don't have a real good feel for everything being so uniform. I understand the nature of it. Um, it's much easier to service everything and when you get it all from, from one provider. But just wanted to have that as a comment that goes to the board that, you know, we're sort of cutting out um, a lot of the artist's uh, creativity in this community. Are there any other questions from board members before we open it up to the public? Okay, it's now open up to the public if they would approach the podium and state their name and residence. Hi, good evening. Uh, Walter Heath, resident of Mora Bay. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak this evening. Uh, my comments and question go to number four of how the program works. And I'd like to get some confirmation uh, this evening that our, uh, Mora Bay and Bloom's current Adopt-A-Park agreement includes other projects as approved, which has enabled us to move beyond our central Adopt-A-Park, which is Centennial Parkway, you know, the large chessboard plaza, to do other work uh, around town. So uh, I'm wondering if there will, I'm really kind of making a pitch for prior approval and hoping that there would be a point person available to whom we could, you know, bring our ideas and maybe, you know, share ideas, not talking about a lot of staff time, maybe two hours a year, uh, just to get prior approval. Because I feel that with prior approval, you, you add that minimal element of programmability to this. And you're our, you have an adoptive park program here. So it adds that element of programmability and predictability. And what we get at the other end is curb appeal, and especially with the volunteer group providing uh, the free labor, you get curb appeal on, on a, you know, a beer budget and you get some nice impact. And you also have the absence of conflict because people know where they're going to be and this is, you know, this is your project, this is what you're working on. So uh, I always like to take the opportunity to kind of educate, you know, your group a little bit about what Morro Bay and Bloom does. And so I'm hoping to get a little help from the control room. I just want to show you an example of, of a project that we've done so that you can, you can see that. Hopefully this projector will work. I could get a little help here. Hopefully this will come up on the screen. Oh, there we go. And what you're, what you're seeing right now is the corner of Beach Street and Embarcadero. And it was a totally barren spot except for uh, some of the sea status and uh, an invasive ginormous tobacco tree plant, which is a noxious and invasive weed that's all along the Embarcadero and really threatens the eelgrass uh, there. But we, we took out the mother plant and in its place, we planted these geraniums. And we've been taking care of this, and 
I'm not kidding you. This is anecdotal, of course, but honestly, if it isn't every other person, it's every third person who comes by this, and this photo has not been doctored, uh, comes back by with just praise. You know, this is the most beautiful thing we've seen on the Embarcadero, uh, and, and thanking us for our work. So, you know, these are our, our manageable projects for us where we can have real impact. We have a lot of cool colors in our environment. And when you add a warm, vibrant color in, in an area like this, it just pops and, and has a great impact. Here's the same scene in, uh, in sunlight. So you can see the impact of this. And you know, we're not talking about large projects, we're talking about things that volunteers can handle. And so um, what we'd like to get prior approval on is to come to a point person in, in public works because that's the group with whom we have our trust relationships and their valued relationships to propose a project such as this. Now what you're seeing here is at the tip of City Park. It's that little uh, median, and it's planted. It's a failing landscape. It's, it's under irrigation, but it needs some attention. It's not a very large area. It's the kind of thing that we could plant and then come back and weed on our monthly, our monthly schedule. This is a more close-up view. As you can see, the drip irrigation is installed. So this would be an example of something we could come to Public Works with and say, well, we wouldn't need the maintenance staff to add irrigation to this, it's already there. And provided it's operational, we could just move in and, and go with it. There might be other projects that might require irrigation, and then we would know that for some period of time, we'd have to provide one of our hand irrigation crews to go through during the week and to, and to keep it up as we do with the geraniums out at Beach and Embarcadero. So that's what I'm talking about the value of this, of the prior approval, and we're not, we're not talking about much here, but I just want to make sure that number four uh, is flexible enough to allow for that where there is the human resource capacity of the group to provide it. So I'm, I'm hoping to get an answer on that tonight. Also with respect to nominal expenses, you know, what we're talking about here, I think this spring we planted, uh, just the cost of plants and materials for us was uh, about uh, $3,000. And you know, that's probably what enough for us to plant and then we maintain that through the year. We carry our own liability insurance. We have uh, privately fundraised for an equipment trailer and all the tools and the safety gear that goes in it. So right now you have an asset. I mean, you have a public asset. And if this kind of thing is valuable, if you can set this aside, you know, we have these impacts of uh, islands of warm color that we commit to water and, and, and to maintenance because the amenities are worthwhile. I know, realize it's an educational process here because you guys are always talking about, you know, public improvements, more permanent types of things. And the kind of thing I'm talking about is more enhancements. But they're greatly appreciated and they stand out and shows that we know what we're doing and that we care about amenities. So uh, I'm... I, I thank you for pursuing this. I thank staff for, for, for setting this out. Uh, we've been in a catch-22 situation ever since Joe Woods left in that, you know, where we had this special projects provision, but we've had no one that we could turn to to get prior approval, nor can we get reimbursement. And there are only so many times that you can go to the well with private fundraising to, for people to provide what is essentially, um, uh, you know, something that, that needs to be replaced eventually. Most of the folks our age want to give to something that that's a legacy project, right? That can that's going to stand the test of time, and that you can show your grandkids. This is the kind of thing where you know it, it doesn't last forever. So uh, I ask you to kind of you know move out of your comfort zone here a little bit and think in terms of of enhancements for the city and in a tourist-based economy, the the uh, the impact it provides for, uh, for that and for economic development. Thanks. Thank you, Walter. We. All appreciate the uh, work your uh, group does. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak at this time? Seeing none, we'll close it to public comment and bring it back to the board for any additional questions or comments of staff. Or does staff have a comment there, it looks like? Based on um, Walter's comments, I see it as a pretty simple process and just some slight modifications of the language of number four that, um, that 
work can, I see it kind of like a process that I'm more familiar with, the change order process in a, in a construction project where the contractor submits a change and the city approves it and everybody's documented as to what gets done. I see that in some cases happening as simply as with a group sending an email to the contact person with the description of what they propose to do. The contact person responds back and says, sounds good to us move forward. Um, um, maybe that wouldn't happen on big projects, but on something like the example that was shown, I see that as perfectly a, a acceptable way to document that change. Good. Staff, I mean, um, board members, uh, Got a Steve. Uh, real quick, um, I assume this Adopt-A-Park program is looking more towards individuals as maintenance, not as replacement of planet life and stuff. I mean, more Bay Beautiful, it's a nonprofit, I assume, is how you're set up. And you come in, you've spent money, you know, and done fundraisers in order to do this work. But I mean, for most of this Adopt a Park program, isn't that more just individuals coming in, cleaning up the trash out of the park and and maintaining the plants that are there it, or, is, it's, or is it or is it incumbent on them to do replacements and things it, like. it's varied um, we have some groups and it's not just individuals it can be groups like rotary um, more bay and bloom more bay beautiful um, some individuals um, they could just maintain what is there um, but a lot of groups like to have a little project to do. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we did um, some re-landscaping of Bayshore, um, um, the park at uh, the near the condos at the south end of town. The name is, I was going to see Bayshore Bluffs, but that's not the name of that park. A village, I think, Bayshore Village. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So um, they prepared a landscaping plan, gave us a plant list. We purchased the plant list. Oh. They mobilized their um, forces to go out there. Um, to so the city is providing some of the plant life for these projects. We have done that. Um, I think I didn't get Walter, the when Walter was talking that they were actually doing fundraising in order to procure the plan. I think the main purpose of their fundraising is to buy their kind of more of their fix their tools, their trailer. Oh. Um, okay. um, the um, desire is to be reimbursed for those kind of expendables, the plant, not expendables, but you know, kind of the things that they're not going to take back to their garage right. and uh, well, yeah, actually, I just don't want to discourage people that want to do that because it's a very nice thing, and it does. And he's right, down at the Embarcadero, that looks very nice right there at Beach and Embarcadero. I wasn't quite sure what promulgated it, but now I know. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Um, <clears throat> Walter has a lot of passion around it, so I think in the revamp of this year, it, it might be nice also to have him go around to each of the areas that are potential areas and, and take the time from from experience of a, a short list for those who want to adopt, knowing what things will probably grow in that area. You know, other species that the city doesn't want, right? You don't want a canopy to grow out and then become a corner lot that, you know, planning comes and tells you is blocking the view. Um, and um, with what he shows there or, or pre-approval, you know, if it hasn't gone as one of the areas that's going to come up for adoption, um, even, you know, he might be presenting a new area. There's nothing wrong with the pre-approval, a quick change order process like you're talking about um, for that. Um, I think it would be, we think it would be great. Um, and sometimes some of those other areas might be tiered. I mean, you know, if you do have a group with more manpower or a group that does have additional insurance and safety things, you know, they might be more suited towards, uh, you know, a higher traffic zone or, or, or a larger project as opposed to, you know, a family of two people that, you know, had the best intention to take on a, a whole park. <laughs> yes. So... 
but I think uh, hopefully Walter will uh, give some of his time to help with some of those areas and some of the items that uh, you know he could help write a small uh, you know task list or a, or an idea of you know this area because there might not be water you need more drought tolerant plants or full sunlight you know foliage and things like that okay John yeah um, Walter brought up a question there who would be the POC on staff for a adopt a tree adopt you know the, for these things most likely our uh, maintenance superintendent um, he was just here he left Mike. so I can volunteer him now uh, um, it, it, because he has um, uh, a handle on all the you know maintenance activities that are going on so that would be um, my preference for the point of contact does that require any, or is, is that your choice, or is that something that has to be run past someone? That would be uh, uh, management's choice. Okay, so city manager and... City manager, public works director would uh, okay. appoint that person to All right. be the point of contact. Thank you. Stu, looks like you're ready. Uh, Walter. Mr. Heath, I think I think you're, that looks great down there. It's fantastic, and I think there should be more of it in the city. And and one of the things that concerns me, of course, is the the critters around that eat plants. And I don't know how you've managed to keep them out of there, but they uh, they seem to be unaffected by gophers and other little critters and so on. And they, uh, but you're doing the effort, and I, I really appreciate it. And it makes our city look much much better. Uh, with even that little start. Uh, there are many other places in the city. Del Mar Park is one of them that uh, could be addressed if you can get if you can cut down on the gophers down there that are eating things. And the, the answer is gopher cages and cross your fingers. Good. You don't spray your vapor. You can't do that. It's, it would be illegal. We're not licensed. That's control applicators So you threaten them. You say, don't do anything here. Leave those plants alone. And, or else. <laughs> No, but I think you're doing a fine job, and I, I think we could we could stand to have a lot more of that in town. It uh, it shows our city has pride in where we live, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I too just want to thank the groups out there like Moral Bay and Bloom that are out helping the city <clears throat> with their time and volunteerism, and and I mean I'm all in favor of adding these adopt a park, adopt a bench, all these programs to help get more volunteers involved but thank you any other comments or suggestions for staff let's see we don't really need to take action on this unless uh, Rob would like to say something on that just gonna say we've taken notes of your comments we've taken notes of the public comments we'll incorporate that into the ne the next round of revisions to the forms get input from the city attorney on uh, the contract language or agreement language and uh, move this forward for um, hopefully adoption soon so that we can have a clear path on adoptions <laughs> okay thank you everyone for all of your work Next item on the agenda is B3, review of the 2017-2018 pavement management program. This goes back to staff? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to pass out um, uh, some revisions that we made to the uh, uh, list and uh, yeah, let me keep one for myself. And there's one. No, there's one big page, one small page, but there's probably too many big pages, but we have extras. Would you like to give start with some background on the... Uh, Presentation.
Thank you. Um, roadway striping, um, storm drain repair. Storm drains are part of uh, streets, as is our trees um, part of streets. Uh, they all um, play into the bigger picture of the um, urban streetscape and all require maintenance dollars. Most of these things, with the exception of the t top one, the pavement management, is funded through the normal gas tax subventions that we get from the state of California. Um, about $299,000 a year. Most of that is spent on labor. Um, um, that pavement management is um, has been funded um, through uh, the lion's share through um, our uh, sales tax, um, special sales tax we have here, Measure Q. So um, typically about a half million dollars a year. We've been able to supplement that over the years with. Um, um, extra revenue, one-time revenue in the budget, um, uh, grant funding, um, money from our funding partners, regional funding partners at SLOCOG. So that's what makes up that. Um, we have um, about... I can get you the more precise number here. Um, This year, about eight hundred and forty-five thousand dollars, five hundred and eight hundred forty-five thousand five, eight hundred and four. 45, 578, and 21 cents that uh, we've estimated that we're going to be spending on streets uh, uh, this year. And that in, would include um, um, some grant money from the Cal Recycle Program um, and um, um, SLOCOG funds, and then the Measure Q money. Um, the goal of the pavement management program is to improve the um, um, PCI or the pavement condition index, the condition of the streets, up to 70. When we first wrote this, we were at 54. We're at about 67 this year. It's aligned with the state of California goal of maintaining a minimum of an average of 70. Um, and to promote pavement preservation. Um, we're a little bit behind on that because we let our streets deteriorate too far to do um, a good pavement management uh, system where you keep the good streets good and um, keep those regular um, maintenance activities on them so you're not spending the high reconstruction dollars but maybe every 20 to 50 years. Everybody's, I think, now familiar with uh, um, this chart here um, where it's showing um, basically the time in years um, versus, you know, pavement condition, how long uh, pavement lasts. What it's also trying to show is that... Um, um, as you get down to that bottom end of that curve, the cost to do pavement ma maintenance gets much more expensive. Um, our current, I um, uh, forgot to change 2016 PCI, I see. Um, current pavement condition index is an average of 67 uh, for our streets. Our arterial and collector streets are in better condition than our local streets are. Um, here's another way to show that same curve. Um, it's showing that um, uh, regular pavement maintenance, the green kind of curves, um, cost less um, over time than waiting for large reconstruction, the large curves um, over time. Um, from 2011 to 2016, we've spent about a um, little over $5 million. We've worked on 26 miles of our 54 miles of the streets, about 49%. Um, we've increased the PCI in this last year from 63 to 67. Um, we have about 5% of our streets with really no life left in them. 
Um, there are streets like, um, there's a short section of Coral um, that has a PCI of about 16 on it. Uh, the end of Beachcomber, the dead end of Beachcomber, um, I think a PCI of 17. Um, streets like Panorama that are, are, are really low. Um, I don't have that number in front of me. Um, other problem streets are um, Little Moro Creek Road. Um, very low PCI on that street, too. We have reconstructed some streets. Um, Kings, Panorama, pieces of Panorama, um, Andros, uh, the, and the section of South Bay Boulevard between um, Highway 1 and Quintana. This year's program, um, we plan to issue a contract uh, in the amount of $805,312. Want to reserve a 5% contingency um, to account for differences in estimated quantities and quantities that actually get placed on the ground. So when we um, calculate the number of streets, we estimate the number of tons of chip the number of tons of oil that will be placed, we won't know that actual quantity until we'll, we get, come really close. Our last years, we were in the, within a percent, um, but um, until we get the way tickets from the contractor. Um, I've got a question. Do we have a feeling of how much traffic there is on individual streets? I mean, we know that Maine is, is, is a high traffic street. I also know that Greenwood is a high traffic street, but the street I live on isn't. Correct. So th the question being, should we spend money on Greenwood and the other streets that are going to the school and going to the park and so on, rather than spending it on Hemlock? Do you have a, do you have a feeling on that? Um, it's a balancing act. You know, when we spend the money versus um, uh, letting the street deteriorate more and having it cost more. The, the idea with Greenwood would be um, we're still pursuing grant money for a full reconstruction of that street and incorporating into a green streets program. So we don't want to do too much to Greenwood while this grant opportunity is there because um, if we make too many improvements to it, we score lower on our grant application. Um, this year we'll be doing some of the same um, techniques because we're using the same contractor. If, if you remember last year, we issued a indefinite quantity, indefinite delivery contract um, so that we could um, have negotiated prices with negotiated um, inflationary costs and um, um, set mobilization costs. So we're doing microsurfacing on streets, um, Cape Seal, um, we're doing the triple layer Cape Seal, and um, this year we're actually doing some limited um, Cape Seal and triple layers where we'll be only doing the uh, travel lanes and not the parking area on those streets that um, are more impacted by the travel areas impacted, but the shoulders are okay. Um, so we'll preserve the middle of the street, um, but not uh, work on the shoulder. And that's to stretch our pavement dollar further. Do you plan to put a line down there so that people can see that's, that side over there is for parking, not driving on? Um, the space. line will be the change in the asphalt. Um, the um, vehicle code talks about where you can park and where you can't park. You park within, um, uh, you know, 18 inches from the curb face or, you know, uh, from the shoulder of the road. Um, we, I passed out some changes. Um, we did have to make some changes due to some of the color of the money that we're using. We received some uh, money from SLOCOG, um, about $245,000, that can only be used on um, arterial and collector streets. It can't be used on local streets. So it's, um, it's um, money that comes from the state. Um, so um, local streets cannot be funded by that source of um, funding. Um, so we removed Preston Lane um, with a f and Vashon, um, two fairly short streets with very low PCIs. Um, AAA or Cape Seal would have done a little bit for them, um, but they're really 
almost too low to um, do anything besides reconstruction with. We changed South Bay Boulevard from Quintana to the bridge from microsurfacing to Cape Seal. Um, there's a little bit of writing and we needed to spend additional dollars on that arterial there. Um, Front Street, um, we reduced the level of um, um, paving from Cape Seal to microsurfacing. Um, we misspelled triple. Um, Ridgeway um, has a uh, um, change from a limited triple layer Cape Seal to a microsurfacing. Juniper um, changed uh, to limited Cape Seal um, from triple layer. And Shasta, um, we increased the um, um, surfacing from microsurfacing to Cape Seal. Microsurfacing, uh, maybe I should go through those. Microsurfacing is almost like a slurry seal, sand, oil. Um, Cape Seal, uh, microsurfacing, then you get a layer of chip over the top of it, followed by oil. Triple layer is a cape seal followed by an additional layer of microsurfacing. So with a cape seal, you end up with um, maybe a half inch of wear, wearable material um, when, you're, when you're done with it. Um, these are all non-structural um, pavement maintenance techniques. We're not doing any paving um, with this year's program. Paving costs six to 15 times more than the methods that we're picking here. We're doing about seven miles of street. If we were going to pave, we might do a mile of street um, of the city's 53 miles. Do you know the square footage difference cost-wise for microsurfacing versus Cape Seal? I think we have it in you could the, be rough. the I mean, bid costs here. That well, I we saw some numbers on cost. I didn't know what they're attributed to. Uh, so um, microsurfacing is um, 19 cents a square foot. Oh, okay. um, uh, Cape Seal is 45 cents a square foot. A little over double, yeah. One of the methods that we had talked about using was, I think uh, Mr. Sauerwein talked about full depth reclamation. When I hear the term full depth reclamation, what I am expecting is milling of asphalt, reprocessing of that asphalt, compaction of the base material, and repaving. That is the traditional definition of full depth reclamation. This contractor uses full depth reclamation in a little bit different um, uh, manner. They are pulling up the asphalt, milling it, blending it back with the base, maybe adding cement to that, compacting it, and then doing a cape seal or a triple layer on top of that. We did that on Panorama and it looks fairly good. I'm just not willing to risk um, doing that on a lot of streets until we can see how that overwinters. Um, it's not paving. Um, it's oil sealing base material. Um, I'm not sure that that is the most uh, the best method to use, but uh, Panorama was in so bad a shape. Um, some of the residents asked us to make it back into a dirt road. At least it could be smoother that way. Um, so we tried this technique there. Um, I may change my opinion once we see it over winter um, and see how it holds up to the garbage truck traffic on, on a saturated uh, uh, subgrade um, to see if there's uh, any street left when we get done with it. But um, I'd be willing to change my opinion if it holds up well. Um, but it's not um, what I think um, uh, maybe John Irwin thought when we talked uh, uh, full depth reclamation. It was not what uh, I thought when we talked full depth rec reclamation. That you're talking in the neighborhood of, you know, eight or nine times the cost of the methods that we're looking at here. So how, so how, so how do you deal with um, a contractor when you both have different uh, definitions of, I mean, is there an industry standard that that needs to be followed on? We're, we're not going to have them do that method now that I know that what they were um, defining as um, full depth rec reclamation. Uh, we're not going to do that um, because um, it's not a 
Um, we tried it as, a, as an experiment, um, but the experiment's not over yet. It has, we have to see how it handle, holds up to a wet season. Okay. You may want to see how it holds up to, say, two or three wet seasons, too. You want to do more, the amount, depending upon the amount of traffic it has, you'd want to do more on streets that have a higher level of traffic on them to prevent them from deteriorating and so on. Have you got a feel on how much traffic there is on various streets in the city? We've taken cra traffic counts on um, um, some streets, um, mainly where the traffic counts occur are on our major streets um, because that's used for planning purposes. Um, we don't do traffic counts on a routine basis. We just don't have the, the staffing to do um, regular traffic counts on uh, um, residential streets. Um, I could probably get a good estimate on the traffic counts based on the number of homes that are on that street. It's on average about two trips per day or a trip and a half per day um, per home on a street. Yeah, and then some of the streets feed from adjoining streets right. into that street. So those are more collector arterial streets, so those have a higher level of traffic. You might need to count on, on those. Um, but local traffic, um, we're not doing routine counts. Typically, the only um, uh, counting that we're doing is for um, 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 stop sign warrants. We have one of those. Oh, we have one. <laughs> okay. And we have one person that um, knows how to operate that uh, device currently, and that's myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I? Do you, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so that full depth reclamation will, so we'll, that's on abeyance until we find out what it really can do. Uh, is there any estimate of, uh, is there, what what percentage of, say, a, a, a new pavement do you get out of that thing? You, they actually put a little bit of cement into it? Yes, they um, till in cement to stabilize the um, subgrade, and then they triple layer over the top of that. How deep do they uh, uh, rototill this? On Panorama, I think they went down 12 inches. They had equipment to go down that deep. Um, okay. Not a huge, uh, it's not like a deep lift section or anything yeah, there. No, I've, 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 I've done treated cement subgrade before, and I think... I think they wanted to go deeper than 12 inches when they did it. When we did it for stabilization of South Bay Boulevard, uh, we went down about three feet. Yeah, um, but that, that, that's a different beast than... Yeah, we were yeah. trying to dry out the subgrade uh, yeah. to, okay. and build a bridge, basically, across the muck. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I have was, I, it, it took me looking between various legends and... and <laughs> tables and stuff it would be really nice if you put the you know like the cs abbreviation after your cape seal and you know just so we know what it what what you were talking about m2 is your micro microsurfacing why why m2 i don't have an i'm sorry i can't remember why it's m2 Okay. I, I mean, I could I could have used the it's what's <laughs> kind of what spits out of the Street Saver program. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's micro the micro type two, micro, type type two, two. microsurfacing. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Was there anything else? Which no, nah, nah, I'm watching with interest, but that. It's all going to be based on costs. So. I, ideally, like I said, we would be repaving. Who's, who's, who's your project engineer for this? Are you going to be it, or is they going to? We have a uh, contract um, project engineer for this, um, um, a company called um, GHD out of San Luis Obispo. Um, they just hired away the um, pavement expert from Rick Engineering. Um, so um, Joe Patterson will be the project engineer on this, and they have inspection staff um, to um, 
uh, that have a lot of experience with with sealing um, to provide that day-to-day -day inspection. Just currently, right now, we don't just don't have the staffing level to do that, how much, nor the experience level. How much experience, or how much of the work did uh, Rick do before he retired? Was he like 60% of, of the inspection work on Cape Seal, or was he 100% and being like 40% of his available time? Um, he probably did about 25%. Uh, the um, associate engineer that was working here was um, almost full-time out on the job as uh, um, watching that work. Um, but he could only be at one place at one time, having um, the consultant help and having multiple inspectors where they can be at a couple locations where the contractor is working um, will help us with our quality control on this. Cost-wise, uh, I heard, saw someone was complaining about, you know, with Rick's reti uh, retirement and the other guys leaving the city that we didn't need to replace them. But how much more than a, a city, normal city staff is this project engineer going to be? Um, their hourly rate is um, at least double um, what the senior engineers was. That's really kind of the going consultant uh, rate. Yeah, I know. Okay. I uh, hope that point is taken up with the uh, city council to make sure they don't bow to some odd pressure. You got, so you got one question, Rick, and it's more, it, it was brought to my attention by someone in the community. And in looking at your maps, I wasn't 100% sure. But it's South Street between Napa and Monterey. Is that a road? Do you have a right of way there, or is it? It shows no road there on one of your maps. The other road shows that it looks like it's... We do have right away there. You do, but... It, it's just no not intent, paved. There's no intent to ever pave it. Is that the plan? Um, perhaps... I mean, it looks like it never had it. Perhaps if there was redevelopment there, um, it could get paved. Oh, okay. But it's not in the plans. It's the not city. in our current plan to um, uh, pave that. Put a ro oh, okay. Good deal. Thank you. Christian, anything? Um... I still have a question on when we went out to bid and um, the uh, the full depth reclamation was that um, in the, uh, the, the terminology used in the bid um, did they win this bid because they used a different standard for what that is I, I'm curious as to no, you know what the financial impact is with this bidder and other bidders. So no, nope, nobody bid on full depth reclamation. Um, the bid for Panorama um, was for a triple layer Cape Seal on Panorama. Um, the contractor evaluated it and they said triple layer Cape Seal is not going to do anything for Panorama, but we could do what they called full depth reclamation um, on it. And um, um, when um, Mr. Sauerwein spoke, he was talking full depth reclamation. In my mind, I'm thinking milling, reprocessing of asphalt, paving. Um, and uh, when I started talking to the contractor about this year's program, I said, oh, you have a, a sub that can bring in a, um, a, a, a train for that small amount of, of asphalt? And they said, no, 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 that's not what we're doing. So I said, no, we're not doing it at all then. We're going to um, wait and see how that approach worked. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's no more questions from the board. We'll open this up to public comment. One more, John. Okay, then possibly after, after uh, public comment. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item? Seeing no one, we'll close public comment, bring it back to the board. Any other additional comments? Uh, Stu? Yeah, I just I have one comment. The, the little different colors on the map, the City of Morro Bay current payment, some of those little colored lines are wrong. And they have, is there a plan to go through and, and change the colors around, or does it make a difference, or what's your, what's your opinion of that? 
wrong in what aspect, I guess? Well, for example, when you look at Elena, Elena's the whole street got done, and it's still yellow. Okay, yes, then we will be changing um, and, that. And there's some other streets in that in my immediate area that I walk all the time okay. that are not exactly reflected on the map. It, it could have been... The, the issue is we can do a seal coating on it and not add appreciable life to the street. It may look black again, um, but it um, doesn't add any more life to the street. So the colors reflect the remaining life in the street over a period of a year or two or three years, that kind of thing. Yes. It seems to me like if you want to get more life out, what you do is, is make the street a little narrower. Some of the streets are narrow and some of them, aren't. Some of them are boulevards. That's um, the um, logic behind the limited um, um, Cape Seals is to only do that treatment on the travel lanes. The actual pulling up the asphalt is another cost. Um, so um, at this point in time, we're not ready to take take on that additional cost of pulling up kind of parking lane asphalt. We have a lot of wide streets and a lot of wide right-of-ways in Morro Bay, and uh, um, that. You know, we some areas have 80 feet of right of way with a 30 foot wide street in the middle of it, and uh, um, a lot of folks think they have a really big yard, but a lot of it's in the right of way. Okay, John, thank you. I remember now. I I was walking back from. This, this afternoon down Beachcomber, and I've noticed that s some of the cracks are beginning to reflect through on Beachcomber near La Siena. You, may, you might have 100 feet of, of areas where the, the pavement looks like it's beginning to deteriorate pretty quickly. On the west side, um, near the edge? No, it was around... Uh, it was in the center there. It just, you know, you, you had gone through and, and did the little tar, tar paint to seal the, the big cracks. And some of them are holding up and some of them aren't. Right. So are you going to, do you have some process where you, you would go back and, and catch those before they get out of hand? Yeah, we have a crack sealing program. We, um, we don't have the equipment in-house. Mm -hmm. So we um, rent the equipment. Um, um, basically for the cost of buying the material and um, there's a contractor from the Bat Valley that will bring his equipment over let us our crews use it um, and we do that on an annual basis now is crack sealing okay so do you have a s survey to look for those things or is it a catch as catch can it's uh, um, the um, maintenance supervisor um, does a windshield survey before they get that equipment so that uh, he knows where his crews need to work and then in the past we had our one of our assistant or associate engineers assist with that we'll probably um, do that with some contract uh, engineering help what speed is he driving at when he does his windshield survey <laughs> um, probably 15 20 miles an hour okay Something you might do too, Rob, is, is maybe get an ad out on the on the website or something that says if you, if you see something, say something, and just keep track of that. We've done that with some other issues in the city, and and it seems to compile a list of things. And you should get twenty complaints, and they, uh, we know we've got an issue there. If you get one, perhaps we don't have any. Yeah, that's that's our um, pothole patching um, program um, is typically um, mainly complaint driven. Okay, any additional questions from staff or comments for the? Okay, then again, this is, you'll take our comments into consideration as you move along to uh, City Council. And this will be going to City Council um, next Tuesday uh, for a um, um, proposed award to um, uh, an amendment to the existing IDIQ contract. Thank you. Uh, the last item, or the next item, is potential future agenda items. Items for council approved work plan. Do you have anything that uh, you foresee us um, working on next month? 
Um, yes, um, the One Water um, program, where we'll be um, talking about um, um, priorities um, and selection criteria for future water supply um, and how we want to weight those options, um, be it cost, reliability, resiliency. Um, the the um, Carollo has a whole exercise that they'll walk us through in um, looking at that. And then they'll do a general update on the, um, the plan. Okay. Anything else? Um, if not, then we will adjourn to October 18th, 2017. Thank you. Uh-huh. And so I'm working with the contractors on